Section 1 of The Murders in the Rue Morgue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe. The mental features discoursed of as the analytical are in themselves but little susceptible of analysis. We appreciate them only in their effects. We know of them, among other things, that they are always in their possessor, when inordinately possessed, a source of the liveliest enjoyment. As the strong man exults in his physical ability, delighting in such exercises as call his muscles into play, so glories the analysts in that moral activity which disentangles. He derives pleasure from even the most trivial occupations bringing his talent into play. He is fond of enigmas, of conundrums, of hieroglyphics, exhibiting in his solutions of each a degree of acumen which appears to the ordinary apprehension preternatural. His results brought about by the very soul and essence of method, have, in truth, the whole air of intuition. The faculty of resolution is possibly much invigorated by mathematical study, and especially by that highest branch of it which, unjustly and merely on account of its retrograde operations, has been called, as if par excellence, analysis. Yet to calculate is not in itself to analyze. A chess player, for example, does the one without effort at the other. It follows that the game of chess, in its effects upon mental character, is greatly misunderstood. I am not now writing a treatise, but simply prefacing a somewhat peculiar narrative by observations very much at random. I will, therefore, take occasion to assert that the higher powers of the reflective intellect are more decidedly and more usefully tasked by the unostentatious game of drafts than by all the elaborate frivolity of chess. In this latter, where the pieces have different and bizarre motions, with various and variable values, what is only complex is mistaken, a not unusual error, for what is profound. The attention is here called powerfully into play. If it flag for an instant, an oversight is committed resulting in injury or defeat. The possible moves being not only manifold, but involute. The chances of such oversights are multiplied, and in nine cases out of ten, it is the more concentrative rather than the more acute player who conquers. In drafts, on the contrary, where the moves are unique and have but little variation, the probabilities of inadvertence are diminished, and the mere attention being left comparatively unemployed, what advantages are obtained by either party are obtained by superior acumen. To be less abstract, let us suppose a game of drafts, where the pieces are reduced to four kings, and where, of course, no oversight is to be expected. It is obvious that here the victory can be decided, the players being at all equal, only by some recherche movement, the result of some strong exertion of the intellect. Deprived of ordinary resources, the analyst throws himself into the spirit of his opponent, identifies himself therewith, and not unfrequently sees thus at a glance the sole methods, sometimes indeed absurdly simple ones, by which he may seduce into error or hurry into miscalculation. Whist has long been noted for its influence upon what is termed the calculating power and men of the highest order of intellect have been known to take an apparently unaccountable delight in it while eschewing chess as frivolous. Beyond doubt there is nothing of a similar nature so greatly tasking the faculties of analysis. 
the best chess player in Christendom may be little more than the best player of chess, but proficiency in whist implies capacity for success in all those more important undertakings where mind struggles with mind. When I say proficiency, I mean that perfection in the game which includes a comprehension of all the sources whence legitimate advantage may be derived. These are not only manifold, but multiform, and lie frequently among recesses of thought altogether inaccessible to the ordinary understanding. To observe attentively is to remember distinctly, and so far the concentrative chess player will do very well at whist, while the rules of Hoyle, themselves based upon the mere mechanism of the game, are sufficiently and generally comprehensible. Thus, to have a retentive memory, and to proceed by the book, are points commonly regarded as the sum total of good playing. But it is in matters beyond the limits of mere rule that the skill of the analyst is evinced. He makes, in silence, a host of observations and inferences, so perhaps to his companions, and the difference in the extent of the information obtained lies not so much in the validity of the inference as in the quality of the observation. The necessary knowledge is that of what to observe. Our player confines himself not at all, nor, because the game is the object, does he reject deductions from things external to the game. He examines the countenance of his partner, comparing it carefully with that of each of his opponents. He considers the mode of assorting the cards in each hand, often counting trump by trump and honor by honor through the glances bestowed by their holders upon each. He notes every variation of face as the play progresses, gathering a fund of thought from the differences in the expression of certainty, of surprise, of triumph, or of chagrin. From the manner of gathering up a trick, he judges whether the person taking it can make another in the suit. He recognizes what is played through feint, by the air with which it is thrown upon the table. A casual or inadvertent word, the accidental dropping or turning of a card, with the accompanying anxiety or carelessness in regard to its concealment, the counting of the tricks, with the order of their arrangement, embarrassment, hesitation, eagerness or trepidation, all afford to his apparently intuitive perception indications of the true state of affairs. The first two or three rounds having been played, he is in full possession of the contents of each hand, and thenceforward puts down his cards with as absolute a precision of purpose as if the rest of the party had turned outward the faces of their own. The analytical power should not be confounded with ample ingenuity, for while the analyst is necessarily ingenious, the ingenious man is often remarkably incapable of analysis. The constructive or combining power, by which ingenuity is usually manifested, and to which the phrenologists, I believe erroneously, have assigned a separate organ, supposing it a primitive faculty, has been so frequently seen in those whose intellect bordered otherwise upon idiocy as to have attracted general observation among writers on morals. Between ingenuity and the analytical ability there exists a difference far greater indeed than that between the fancy and the imagination, but of a character very strictly analogous. It will be found, in fact, that the ingenious are always fanciful, and the truly imaginative never otherwise than analytic. The narrative which follows will appear to the reader somewhat in the light of a commentary upon the propositions just advanced. Residing in Paris during the spring and part of the summer of 18 blank, I there became acquainted with a Monsieur C. Auguste Dupin. 
This young gentleman was of an excellent, indeed of an illustrious family, but by a variety of untoward events had been reduced to such poverty that the energy of his character succumbed beneath it, and he ceased to bestir himself in the world or to care for the retrieval of his fortunes. By courtesy of his creditors there still remained in his possession a small remnant of his patrimony, and upon the income arising from this he managed, by means of a rigorous economy, to procure the necessities of life without troubling himself about its superfluities. Books, indeed, were his sole luxuries, and in Paris these are easily obtained. Our first meeting was at an obscure library in the Rue Montmartre, where the accident of our both being in search of the same very rare and very remarkable volume brought us into closer communion. We saw each other again and again. I was deeply interested in the little family history which he detailed to me with all that candor which a Frenchman indulges whenever mere self is his theme. I was astonished, too, at the vast extent of his reading, and above all, I felt my soul enkindled within me by the wild fervor and the vivid freshness of his imagination. Seeking in Paris the objects I then sought, I felt that the society of such a man would be to me a treasure beyond price, and this feeling I frankly confided to him. It was at length arranged that we should live together during my stay in the city, and as my worldly circumstances were somewhat less embarrassed than his own, I was permitted to be at the expense of renting and furnishing in a style which suited the rather fantastic gloom of our common temper, a time-eaten and grotesque mansion, long deserted through superstitions into which we did not inquire, and tottering to its fall in a retired and desolate portion of the Faubourg Saint-Germain. Had the routine of our life at this place been known to the world, we should have been regarded as madmen, although perhaps as madmen of a harmless nature. Our seclusion was perfect. We admitted no visitors. Indeed, the locality of our retirement had been carefully kept a secret from my own former associates, and it had been many years since Dupin had ceased to know or be known in Paris. We existed within ourselves alone. It was a freak of fancy in my friend, for what else shall I call it, to be enamored of the night for her own sake, and into this bizarrier, as into all his others, I quietly fell, giving myself up to his wild whims with a perfect abandon. The sable divinity would not herself dwell with us always, but we could counterfeit her presence. At the first dawn of the morning we closed all the messy shutters of our old building, lighting a couple of tapers which, strongly perfumed, threw out only the ghastliest and feeblest of rays. By the aid of these we then busied our souls in dreams, reading, writing, or conversing, until warned by the clock of the advent of the true darkness. Then we sallied forth into the streets arm in arm, continuing the topics of the day, or roaming far and wide until a late hour, seeking, amid the wild lights and shadows of the populous city, that infinity of mental excitement which quiet observation can afford. At such times I could not help remarking and admiring although from his rich ideality I had been prepared to expect it, a peculiar analytic ability in Dupin. He seemed, too, to take an eager delight in its exercise, if not exactly in its display, and did not hesitate to confess the pleasure thus derived. He boasted to me, with a low chuckling laugh, that most men, in regard to himself, wore windows in their bosoms, and was wont to follow up such assertions by direct and very startling proofs of his intimate knowledge of my own. 
His manner at these moments was frigid and abstract. His eyes were vacant in expression, while his voice, usually a rich tenor, rose into a treble which would have sounded petulantly, but for the deliberateness and entire distinctness of the enunciation. Observing him in these moods, I often dwelt meditatively upon the old philosophy of the bi-part soul, and amused myself with the fancy of a double dupin, the creative and the resolvent. Let it not be supposed, from what I have just said, that I am detailing any mystery or pinning any romance. What I have described in The Frenchman was merely the result of an excited or perhaps of a diseased intelligence. But of the character of his remarks at the periods in question, an example will best convey the idea. We were strolling one night down a long, dirty street in the vicinity of the Palais Royal. Being both apparently occupied with thought, neither of us had spoken a syllable for fifteen minutes at least. All at once Dupin broke forth with these words. He is a very little fellow, that's true, and would do better for the Theatre des Varietes. There can be no doubt of that, I replied unwittingly, and not at first observing, so much had I been absorbed in reflection, the extraordinary manner in which the speaker had chimed in with my meditations. In an instant afterward I recollected myself, and my astonishment was profound. Dupin, said I gravely, this is beyond my comprehension. I do not hesitate to say that I am amazed, and can scarcely credit my senses. How was it possible you should know I was thinking of— Here I paused, to ascertain beyond a doubt whether he really knew of whom I thought. Of Chantilly, said he, why do you pause? You were remarking to yourself that his diminutive figure unfitted him for tragedy. This was precisely what had formed the subject of my reflections. Chantilly was a quodam cobbler of the Rue Saint-Denis, who, becoming stage-mad, had attempted the role of Xerxes in Crébillon's tragedy so-called, and been notoriously pasquinated for his pains. "'Tell me, for heaven's sake,' I exclaimed, "'the method, if method there is, by which you have been enabled to fathom my soul in this matter.' In fact, I was even more startled than I would have been willing to express. "'It was the fruitier,' replied my friend, "'who brought you to the conclusion that the mender of souls "'was not of sufficient height for Xerxes at Eat Genus Omne.' "'The fruitier? You astonish me. I know no fruitier whomsoever.' "'The man who ran up against you as we entered the street?' It may have been fifteen minutes ago. I now remembered that, in fact, a fruitier carrying upon his head a large basket of apples had nearly thrown me down, by accident, as we passed from the Rue C into the thoroughfare where we stood. But what had this to do with Chantilly I could not possibly understand. There was not a particle of charlatanière about Dupin. I will explain, he said, and that you may comprehend all clearly. We must first retrace the course of your meditations, from the moment in which I spoke to you until that of the rencontre with the fruitier in question. The larger links of the chain run thus. Chantilly, Orion, Dr. Nichols, Epicurus, Stereotomy, the Street Stones, the Fruitier. There are few persons who have not at some moment of their lives amused themselves in retracing the steps by which particular conclusions of their own minds have been attained. The occupation is often full of interest, and he who attempts it for the first time is astonished by the apparent illimitable distance and incoherence between the starting point and the goal. What, then, must have been my amazement when I heard the Frenchman speak what he had just spoken, and when I could not help acknowledging that he had spoken the truth. He continued, 
We had been talking of horses, if I remember aright, just before leaving the Rue C. This was the last subject we discussed. As we crossed into this street, a fruitier with a large basket upon his head, brushing quickly past us, thrust you upon a pile of paving stones collected at a spot where the causeway is undergoing repair. You stepped upon one of the loose fragments, slipped, slightly strained your ankle, appeared vexed or sulky, muttered a few words, turned to look at the pile, and then proceeded in silence. I was not particularly attentive to what you did, but observation has become with me of late a species of necessity. You kept your eyes upon the ground, glancing with a petulant expression at the holes and ruts in the pavement, so that I saw you were still thinking of the stones, until we reached the little alley called La Martine, which had been paved by the way of experiment with the overlapping and riveted blocks. Here your countenance brightened up, and perceiving your lips move, I could not doubt that you muttered the word stereotomy, a term very effectively applied to this species of pavement. I knew that you could not say to yourself stereotomy without being brought to think of atomies, and thus of the theories of Epicurus, and since, when we discussed this subject not very long ago, I mention to you how singularly, yet with how little notice, the vague guesses of that noble Greek had met with confirmation in the late nebular cosmogony. I felt that you could not avoid casting your eyes upward to the great nebula in Orion, and I certainly expected that you would do so. You did look up, and I was now assured that I had correctly followed your steps. But in that bitter tirade upon Chantilly, which appeared in yesterday's Musee, the satirist, making some disgraceful allusions to the cobbler's change of name upon assuming the buskin, quoted a Latin line about which we have often conversed. I mean the line, Perdedit antiquum litera sonum. I had told you that this was in reference to Orion, formerly written Urion, and from certain pungencies connected with this explanation I was aware that you could not have forgotten it. It was clear, therefore, that you would not fail to combine the two ideas of Orion and Chantilly. That you did combine them I saw by the character of the smile which passed upon your lips. You thought of the poor cobbler's immolation. So far you had been stooping in your gait, but now I saw you draw yourself up to your full height. I was then sure that you reflected upon the diminutive figure of Chantilly. At this point I interrupted your meditations, to remark that as, in fact, he was a very little fellow, that Chantilly, he would do better at the Theatre des Veriates. Not long after this we were looking over an evening edition of the Gazette des Trebonaux, when the following paragraphs arrested our attention. Extraordinary murders. This morning, about three o'clock, the inhabitants of the quarter, St. Roch, were aroused from sleep by a succession of terrific shrieks, issuing apparently from the fourth story of a house in the Rue Morgue, known to be the sole occupancy of one Madame L'Espanay and her daughter, Mademoiselle Camille L'Espanay. After some delay, occasioned by a fruitless attempt to procure admission in the usual manner, the gateway was broken in with a crowbar, and eight or ten of the neighbors entered accompanied by two gendarmes. By this time the cries had ceased, but as the party rushed up the first flight of stairs, two or more rough voices in angry contention were distinguished, and seemed to proceed from the upper part of the house. As the second landing was reached, these sounds also had ceased, and everything remained perfectly quiet. The party spread themselves and hurried from room to room. Upon arriving at a large black chamber in the fourth story, the door of which, being found locked with the key inside, was forced open, a spectacle presented itself 
which struck every one present not less with horror than with astonishment. The apartment was in the wildest disorder, the furniture broken and thrown about in all directions. There was only one bedstead, and from this the bed had been removed and thrown into the middle of the floor. On a chair lay a razor besmeared with blood. On the hearth were two or three long and thick tresses of gray human hair, also dabbed in blood, and seeming to have been pulled out by the roots. Upon the floor were found four Napoleons, an earring of topaz, three large silver spoons, three smaller of metal d'alger, and two bags containing nearly four thousand francs in gold. The drawers of a bureau, which stood in one corner, were open, and had been apparently rifled, although many articles still remained in them. A small iron safe was discovered under the bed, not under the bedstead. It was open, with the key still in the door. It had no contents beyond a few old letters and other papers of little consequence. Of Madame L'Espanay no traces were here seen, but an unusual quantity of soot being observed in the fireplace. A search was made in the chimney, and, horrible to relate, the corpse of the daughter, head downward, was dragged therefrom, it having been thus forced up the narrow aperture for a considerable distance. The body was quite warm. Upon examining it, many excoriations were perceived, no doubt occasioned by the violence with which it had been thrust up and disengaged. Upon the face were many severe scratches, and upon the throat dark bruises and deep indentations of fingernails, as if the deceased had been throttled to death. After a thorough investigation of every portion of the house, without further discovery, the party made its way into a small paved yard in the rear of the building where lay the corpse of the old lady, with her throat so entirely cut that, upon an attempt to raise her, the head fell off. The body, as well as the head, was fearfully mutilated, the former so much so as scarcely to retain any semblance of humanity. To this horrible mystery there is not as yet, we believe, the slightest clue. The next day's paper had these additional particulars. The Tragedy in the Rue Morgue Many individuals have been examined in relation to this most extraordinary and frightful affair. The word affair has not yet in France that levity of import which it conveys with us. But nothing whatever has transpired to throw light upon it. We give below all the material testimony elicited. Pauline Dubourg, laundress, disposes that she knew both the deceased for three years, having washed for them during that period. The old lady and her daughter seemed on good terms, very affectionate towards each other. They were excellent pay, could not speak in regard to their mode or means of living, believed that Madame L. told fortunes for a living, was reputed to have money put by, never met any persons in the house when she called for the clothes or took them home, was sure that they had no servant in employed. There appeared to be no furniture in any part of the building except in the fourth story. Pierre Moreau, tobacconist, deposes that he has been in the habit of selling small quantities of tobacco and stuff to Madame L'Espanay for nearly four years, was born in the neighborhood, and has always resided there. The deceased and her daughter had occupied the house in which the corpses were found for more than six years. It was formerly occupied by a jeweler who underlet the upper rooms to various persons. The house was the property of Madame L. She became dissatisfied with the abuse of the premises by her tenant, and moved into them herself refusing to let any portion. The old lady was childish. Witness had seen the daughter some five or six times during the six years. The two lived an exceedingly retired life, were reputed to have money. 
had heard it said among the neighbors that Madame L. told fortunes, did not believe it, had never seen any person enter the door except the old lady and her daughter, a porter once or twice, and a physician some eight or ten times. Many other persons, neighbors, gave evidence to the same effect. No one was spoken of as frequenting the house. It was not known whether there were any living connections of Madame L. and her daughter. The shutters of the front room were seldom opened. Those in the rear were always closed, with the exception of the large back room, fourth story. The house was a good house, not very old. Isidore Mousset, gendarme disposes that he was called to the house about three o'clock in the morning and found some twenty or thirty persons at the gateway, endeavoring to gain admittance, forced it open at length with a bayonet, not with a crowbar, had but little difficulty in getting it open, on account of its being a double or folding door, and bolted neither at bottom nor top. The shrieks were continued until the gate was forced, and then suddenly ceased. They seemed to be screams of some person or persons in great agony, were loud and drawn out, not short and quick. Witnesses led the way upstairs. Upon reaching the first landing, heard two voices in loud and angry contention, the one a gruff voice, the other much shriller, a very strange voice. Could distinguish some words of the former, which was that of a Frenchman, was positive that it was not a woman's voice. Could distinguish the words sacre and diab. The shrill voice was that of a foreigner. Could not be sure whether it was the voice of a man or of a woman. Could not make out what was said, but believed the language to be Spanish. The state of the room and of the bodies was described by this witness as we described them yesterday. End of Part 1